I've worked on this for two years. I put everything I had into it. There's going to be surprises in here. I worked with this and we sent people over to talk to FBI agents. My daughter, I was never present when these interviews took place and we recorded them, recordings, and there's so many different surprises that's going to come up in this tape. I think you're going to love it. There's no question in my mind. If you really love it, share it with somebody that you love. They're going to love it. And they're going to thank you for it. I mean, I don't, I'm lost for words. For the time and the effort that I put into this, I put, this is all the marbles to me. I put my heart and soul in this. And I think you'll hear it. You'll know it. And if you like it and love it, we're going to be working on the other nine episodes for season one and then season two. And uh, it'll come out until we're done with the entire story of my life from soup to nuts. Enjoy it. December 11th, 1990. While I'm on the lam, Louis Susenti, my bodyguard driver, comes to me and says, John wants me to come in. He wants me to come in and meet him at the club in Little Italy. It was always FBI or news trucks or media. Didn't make sense that I was gonna go there. But the boss is the boss. I went home that night, I came in, me and my wife hugged. I had a full beard, took a shower, shaved. And the next day I got up, got dressed, and got ready to go down to Mulberry Street that afternoon. We pulled up. We got out of the car, we walked to the club, opened the door and walked in. And all the people in the club were made guys and associates. They all knew who I was. Hey Sammy, how you doing? How, how's things? You look great, this and that, all that bullshit. I walked to the back of the club. I shook John's hand and Frankie's hand. I sat down. A couple of minutes passed, the door opened up and agents came in. For many years, we have tolerated in America a syndicate of organized criminals whose power is now reaching unparalleled heights. Tonight, the mafia, not a movie the real thing. The personal suffering they cause to our society in human and fiscal terms, climate of lawlessness that its very existence fosters, has made this network of professional criminals a costly and tragic part of our history. Here in New York, it was said you could hardly do business, transport anything, build a building without the mob somehow taking a piece of the action. Today, the power of organized crime reaches into every segment of our society. Salvatore Gravano, Sammy the Bull, the underboss, the second in command of the most powerful mob family in America. The reasons for the mob's success are clear. Organization and discipline, vows of secrecy and loyalty, insulation of its leaders from direct criminal involvement, bribery and corruption of law enforcement and public officials, violence and threats, against those who would testify or resist this criminal conspiracy, all have contributed to the protective curtain of silence that surrounds its activities. For years, the FBI has been watching and listening to the mob street corner meeting. The time has come to cripple the power of the mob in America. For the first time ever, Sammy the Bull Gravano tells his story. This is our thing. Vincent the Chin Giganti. Chin Giganti is extremely dangerous. He ran the Genovese family with an iron hand. No games with him. He was so dangerous that he didn't allow people to say his name. They called him Chin because if you referred to him, you would touch your chin. 
so the other person knew who you were talking about. You didn't want to get caught on tape saying his name. He was extremely powerful. Frankie DeChico is a friend of mine. He's a captain in the Gambino family. Very, very powerful captain. His father was a made guy. He was in the same crew I was in. His uncle was a captain. He was well, well respected and feared. He was respected because he was always for the underdog. And I grew up with him, so we were extremely close. On April 13th, 1986, we went to a club on 86th Street. Me and Frankie went there. A made guy in the Lucchese family, a guy named Frankie Hartz, came in. He asked Frankie for a, a lawyer's card. So Frankie went immediately into his wallet to give it to him. And he said, I don't have it. It must be in the car. I said, Frankie, you want me to go get it? He said, no, I'll get it. And he walked across the street with Frankie Hartz. He opened the door of his car and he sat into the car, the passenger side sideways and opened the glove compartment while he was talking to Frankie Hartz who was standing right next to the car. The next thing, there was this huge explosion that rocked the whole neighborhood. Windows broke. I never even heard an explosion like that. I came out of the club, so did at least 20, 30 guys. I went to grab him to pull him away from the car. As I pulled him a little bit, one of his legs seemed to be detached. Same thing with one of his arms. When I went under him, there was no part of his body left. My hand went right through, almost to the outside part of his stomach. So my hand was actually in his body. And that started us thinking about where could this have come from? Picking him up, a lifelong friend of mine, was sickening how I saw him dead. It's not like he was shot. It's not like things that we were used to. He was completely blown away. After months of thinking about this and investigating it, most of us came to the conclusion the only one who had the connections the balls to do this would be Vincent the Chin Gigante. John Gotti called me to a private meeting, just me and him. And he said, I think you're right, Sammy. I believe it's Chin Gigante. I said, you want me to kill the boss of the Genovese family now? Yes, take him out. Actually, it was music to my ears. And I'll give you a reason why. When I knelt at Frankie's funeral, I knelt at this coffin and I whispered to him, Frankie, I'll never let this go. I will kill who did this. I will kill everyone who was involved. I will kill everybody who knew about it in advance. I was gonna now live up to my oath to him. This was extremely important to me. I left the meeting and I started to assemble people that I would use kept this very low key, but I designed who would stay on one corner with a gun, who would drive a crash car, who would drive a backup car. And a van would come, pull up to his club, the door would open, and someone would come out and kill Chin and whoever the fuck he was with, with that Uzi machine gun.
One of my guys said, Sam, who who be the shooter? I said, me this time. Me. I owe this motherfucker. But this hit was enormous. It was bigger than the Castellano hit was. For one reason. When we killed Castellano and Tommy Bellotti in front of Spark Steakhouse, it was an internal thing. Now, this was killing a boss of another family. To me, it was time to get even for Frankie DeChico. For me, it was time to live up to what I told him in a coffin. But one day, John called me in and he told me the hits off with Chit. Put it on the side. There's an indictment that came down. I'm on the indictment with others. I'm not sure if you're on it. Go on the lamb. FBI case agent George Gabriel. When we're ready to do the indictments, they got wind of something. And next thing we hear, Sammy's on the lam because they were convinced we were going to be taking him down, and he wanted Sammy out there to be in a position to run things. I always wanted to be an FBI agent. All other criminal matters, you're really reactive, if you will. The crime has to happen for you to open a case. With organized crime, they're doing it while you're watching them. I mean, they're walking criminals. And the challenge there is, I mean, yes, you're going to prosecute on something that happened, but it's, how do you stop it? In New York, we had five organized crime families. We're the bad guys in these neighborhoods. We're not the good guys. The office had eight organized crime squads. There was one squad dedicated to each of the five families. Typically, the squads had eight to 13 guys. The Gambino squad, we had about 13 at our heyday. Now, that may sound like a lot of people, but when you figure the family had a membership of about 250 made guys, and most made guys have half a dozen guys around them, you're talking well over 400 people that you've got to be targeting. You only have 13 guys to do it. So you have to be real selective in who you go after. Most of the criminal conduct in organized crime, especially at the level of the hierarchy, which is the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere, is really talking, right? They're ordering crimes. They're not committing them themselves. So for me to put them in jail, I have to catch them where they're talking. The Ravenite Club is where John made everybody show up to pay respect to him. So John again, kind of got in the face of organized crime, if you will, where this stuff is supposed to happen in secret, he brought it into the daylight. If you needed to talk to the boss, that's where you went to meet him. The problem is, it may be easy to bug the club, but not the best conversations are happening there. We had to win. We had to start really dismantling it. If you take this guy down, you potentially take everything down. For electronic surveillance, that's considered the most invasive tactic, so you have to show you've exhausted everything else. And short of, a, of putting a bug someplace would be an undercover operation, and those typically don't work with the mob. So people, I think, think you, you put a bug someplace and you just decide you're going to do it. I mean, it's a complicated order. You have to file an affidavit with the judge, and the affidavit has to show enough convincing information that stops just short of probable cause, which is what it takes to indict somebody. The significance of the Ravenite Club, it became John's headquarters. The focus of that investigation was to find the right spots to put the bugs to get the best conversations. Having those really good criminal conversations at the highest level. So we, we tried the Ravenite we tried the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. For a while, we heard he had an office in Midtown in a uh, garment center building. We tried putting bugs in there. He was going to all these places, but the, the better conversations weren't happening. 
The audibility, which is always a problem, was terrible. Overall, I was bugging him for about 60 months at different locations, trying to find the right place. We started noticing John's voice disappearing in the club, and he wasn't coming outside because we had surveillance on the outside. We heard there was an internal door that he was just stepping out into the back in a hallway there. So we actually bugged the hallway for a while. And we got a couple of more conversations. Then all of a sudden we'd hear footsteps going upstairs and the voices would disappear again. And we learned that he was going to an apartment. Years ago, there was a guy by the name of Mike Sorelli, was a Gambino guy. I think he owned the building. And he was the caretaker of the club, which was another way they could kind of protect it and secure it. Well, he passed, but his wife still had an apartment upstairs. And his nephew, Norman DuPont, was the current caretaker of the club. And John arranged that when he wanted to have a really secret conversation, he'd go up and tell his aunt, go get a cup of coffee someplace. And she'd clear out and they'd get access to the apartment. So we, we learned about that. We were able to kind of verify it uh, for an affidavit. It just took months to be able to get in there because it wasn't an easy place to go in. I think we go about three weeks after we put the bugs in with no conversations. We don't hear anything. And November 29th, I get a call, I'm at home, and, and all I hear is they're up in the apartment and the audibility is good. I literally couldn't wait to get in the office the next day to listen to the tapes. I think I, I kept calling back to the plant being a pain in the ass. And, you know, just, you know, yeah, we're getting tidbits. They're talking about killing and, you know, this and that. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So, you know, get in the next day to listen to it. And, hey, the clarity was fantastic. And I'm listening to this and I was convinced he's done. We got five conversations. The last one was in May of 90. The first one was November of 89. We only got five conversations in that time span. But what shocked me even more was the first conversation, and we're talking almost five years after they killed Paul, four years after, this, why they killed Paul Castellano. I mean, John's on a, almost an hour diatribe about why Paul Castellano got whacked without saying Paul's name, but it was clear who they were talking about. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, by the second, third one, there was no doubt. The guy's going to jail for life. I mean, almost to the point where we were concerned the judge was going to say, how much more do you need? We have an indictment, as far as I'm concerned. John's trying to find out. He's tasking guys, go speak to your lawyers, go speak to people. We hear there's a big one coming. We don't know who's involved. It's a cat and mouse game. All to kind of preserve what was going on and, and when we were going to do stuff. He wasn't sure what the hell was going on. In Gotti's case, we had it all presented. We were starting to move forward to getting ready to come down with our arrests and plan around it. The minute you issue it, it becomes public record. At some point, that there's an arrest warrant out there, and we didn't want this out. We know for sure Sammy's gone. So we're like, all right, we're going to put this all on hold. We'll do whatever we've got to do in the meantime. He's got to come back sooner or later. The Ravenite was the ideal place to take these guys down. It was symbolic. It was John's place. So we were taking him out there. And we wanted to be able to arrest all of them at the same time. And that was the one place we could do it. December 10th, 1990. While I'm on the lam, Louis Susenti, my bodyguard driver, comes to me and says, John wants me to come in. He wants me to come in and meet him at the club in Little Italy. It was always FBI or news trucks or media. Didn't make sense that I was gonna go there. But the boss is the boss. I went home that night, I came in, me and my wife hugged. I had a full beard, took a shower, shaved. And the next day I got up, got dressed 
and got ready to go down to Mulberry Street that afternoon. We get word that Sammy's coming back. The plan is, as soon as we confirm that he's in town, I'll go get the indictments and we're gonna just pick him up. I would go into the club, meet with John, and then probably go back on the lamp. So I go and I start getting the indictment. I'm in Brooklyn working with the U.S. Attorney and the, and the grand jury. So I get him. We pulled up, we got out of the car, we walked to the club, opened the door, walked in, and I, all the people in the club were made guys, and associates. They all knew who I was. Hey, Sammy, how you doing? How, how's things? You look great, this and that, all that bullshit. I walked to the back of the club. I shook John's hand and Frankie's hand. I sat down. We hear that Sammy went into the club. And I go running over. So I'm the lead car, and I, you know, I've got everyone lined up behind me. And I'm like, all right, on go, we're going. A couple of minutes passed, the door opened up, and agents came in. We get out of the car, and you just focus on the front door, and you know, and there's wise guys all over the place, and just go bursting in. I'm not even in a vest. I mean, I'm just in a jacket. I'm armed, obviously. I wasn't concerned that any violence was gonna happen. These guys are not that stupid. Now, one agent I remember, he was George Gabriel. He was a street agent, big agent. He came in, I think, with another guy. They parted like Moses parted the sea. I mean, these guys just got out of the way when I got in there. They were extremely compliant. You know, on any other day, these guys would kill anybody, but in that, atmosphere, environment, that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to be a problem. That is the first time I ever set foot in Raven Knight Social Club. Short time went by, and more guys came, police cars came, NYPD. And there were probably about 30 of these wise guys. I'm not going to say it's not intimidating, but, you know, it's. A, I, I guess when you're in the moment, you're in the moment, and that's all there is to it. They wanted a bus to hold three of us together. This was the organized crime case, really, for the Bureau at that time. I mean, we had several others, but this was the target that had to be gotten. They told all the people in the club, it's got nothing to do with you guys. Give us your ID, we'll take your name, and you can leave. It has nothing to do with you. I said, listen, everybody's going to get to walk out of here. I want you to just, you know, take your time. You give these guys your name. Whatever they ask you, you answer, and you're going to get to go. And then when you're all done, we're going to take these three with us. George Gabriel come over and told John, you can't leave, John, you're under arrest. You, Sammy, you're under arrest as well. You too, Frankie Lacasio. You know, John's sitting at his round table and Frankie and Sammy are there. You know, and, and John's the typical wise says, well, you know, we knew you were coming. I said, well, how come you didn't tell Sammy? You guys are in suits, he's in a jacket, come on. He didn't get the word? John always had these cutesy little remarks and stuff, and he says, Norman, give me, Sammy, and Frankie a cup of coffee. I'm not leaving until we're done with the coffee. And he's just kind of jawboning, ah, you know, I'm going to beat this one too. I'll be home. Don't worry about it. He's talking to Frankie and Sammy, probably nervous. I looked at George Gabriel. He was very quiet, very polite. They still have no idea what they're being indicted for at that point, what the significance is. And it's not until I get him out of the club and in the car that we even have that kind of conversation. We had our coffee, and they took us out and put us in separate cars. I was in one car. John Gotti was in one car, I believe, with George Gabriel. And Frankie Lucasio got into another car. We got everybody out. Now we just, it's time to go process these guys. Well, there was two FBI agents that were assigned to me. They even had their own office in Staten Island that dealt with just me. They were the guys, Frank and Maddie, actually they called them the twins because you saw one, you always saw the other one. They used to watch me all the time. I got to know them over the years of being watched. They cuffed me and they took me in their car. When we bring these guys out of the club after the arrests, John's going with me and I had a detective that was in my car and my partner. So we put John in the back. Frank Lacasio goes with Billy Noon and, uh, and Walter Takano. Sammy goes with uh, Maddie and Frank. So we got in the car, and I believe it was Frank Spiro, the agent. 
told me, he said, Sammy, there's no need for us to cuff you. Then he asked me, he said, do you have money on you? I says, yeah, I do. I have a couple of thousand, three, four thousand. Got jewelry? Yeah, I got a pinky ring and a watch. Why? He said, you're not coming out. When they arrest you, you're going to be staying there. FBI Special Agent Frank Spiro. We told Sammy, Sammy, they're going to take all your personal items off you when you get there. So if you want, you can give it to us. We'll make sure we give it to Debbie tomorrow. So he says, I appreciate that, Bo. That's how much they were following us. He's calling my wife like, like he knew her 100 years, Deb, he's calling her. I said, all right. So I gave him the money, less $50. I kept in my pocket because you got to roll in with something. The MCC is a mile away from where the Ravenite was, so it's not a particularly long ride. And John is instantly jawboning. Well, you know, this, I'm going to be out. Ah, this case is nothing and this and that. Nobody wants to put me in jail. Your mother's probably rooting for me. I said, well, you don't know my mother. I mean, she's a Greek immigrant. She doesn't like you. I said, but I tell you what, you know, you really talked a little too much in Mrs. Sorelli's apartment. And that shut him up for a second. Because that's when he learned that's where this case was coming from. As we got close to MCC in New York. There was news media. There's a lot more cops, more agents. And they said, Sammy, turn around, we gotta cuff you again. We're gonna take you out. The news media's here. We can't just walk you out. We're not, all right, all right. I turned around. They put the cuffs back on me and I got out. Detectives and FBI were all around us and they escorted us into the MCC, into the prison. They checked us in and they take, do you have jewelry, do you have money? They did it with John, he had four or 5,000 on him. They did the same thing with Frankie Lucasio. And then they did it with me. I said, I don't have no jewelry on me. And I took out my money, which was $50. John looked at me and said, that's all you got on you is $50? I wasn't about to tell him I gave it to the agents. So I said, yeah, that's all I got. So I said, Sammy, remind me, when we beat this case, I got to give you a raise. The guards laughed, the FBI agents laughed. John always had the way about him with cutesy little remarks and things, and it was cute. John was able to see how much Sam, Sammy had on him, right, Matty? Yeah. Um, FBI Special Agent Matthew Corico. And he, he made a comment. He said, Sammy, you yeah. got to give you a yeah. raise. Yeah. But was, was, they, everything was nonchalant. Yeah. John, John was like Collins on yeah. a cloud. He oh, was yeah. like, oh, we're right. You know, he had beaten so many raps. John had beaten so many raps. He figured this is just another, another rap. We'll be out of there in no time. But this time he was wrong. We had the goods. Me and him were super tight. We were attached at the hip. I loved the guy. At this point, we were still close. John was smart in, in picking Sammy because Sammy not only had respect from, especially the Brooklyn factions of the Gambino family, but he had great interaction and respect with the other families. He was close to Vicar Musso and Gas Pipe, who were the Lucchese guys. Um, he had good ins with the Genovese guys and the Columbos. So there's always disputes between these guys. So you have that ambassador, if you will, who's got the access, the respect, to go in and sit down at a beef and kind of come out with a good result, that's value. I mean, you can't put a price on that. Sammy had that. John surrounded himself with killers. And, and Sammy, I mean, he was a known quantity. That was the intimidating thing about having to deal with a guy like that. This was a, a trigger puller. This was a guy who could order a hit, you know, and carry it out. He wasn't one of the street guys that had to be told to go do something. He was a decision maker. Now, granted, you still have to put it on record and stuff, but bottom line was he had the guys here. He could do what he thought he needed to do. It's still intimidating when you're going by these guys because it's not lost on you who and what they are. Sammy, of all of them, oddly enough, I think I was more intimidated because I didn't know him well. 
Metropolitan Correctional Center. At the beginning, the relationship with John was good. I loved the guy. I didn't have no idea what this indictment was about. We're put on the ninth floor. That whole floor is locked down. Me and John are put in one cell together. And we're getting along perfectly. And the government says we want them held without bail. They're a threat to society. The judge, he points at me and he says, I know him. He's been before me in a tax evasion case, very serious case. I gave him bail and he was here on time every time. Show me how he's a threat to society and the other guys too. The government was forced into a position of saying, okay, we'll make you listen to the tapes. That's basically the first time I hear about tapes. A day or two or three later, they postpone for the government to bring in the tapes. They bring in the tapes and the tapes are devastating. John Gotti is caught on a rant saying things that were totally not true. And I am blown away. Gotti, he is there talking about me, about killing this guy and that guy and taking over the union or taking over this business. And none of it's true. But when I heard this tape, I was devastated. He's betraying me behind my back. That's how I'm on this pinch. He knew at that court hearing, when I left, I was the very defiant with him. I was completely devastated listening to this thing. So, he knows I'm, I'm completely pissed. After that day, the judge holds us without bail. We go back in. Mine and John's relationship is extremely shaky now. There's a few more things that happen. My tipping point was John says, I got a way where I could beat this case. He tells me and Frankie, my guys are gonna go over all the documents and tapes We'll take care of that. You guys are not allowed to listen or read them. That's one of the conversations. And I said, John, I'm indicted on two, three murders, a couple of conspiracies to murder. I'm facing life without parole. I can't listen to a tape or read a transcript. I can't fight for my freedom. That's the way it's going to be. The boss is the boss. The boss must go free. The thing I wouldn't think of was writing. That was like the unthinkable, the untouchable. And I'm thinking now, that's exactly what he's doing. He's giving me up to the government. Now, what the fuck is the difference whether he's taking the stand, he's backing the tape up, What's the difference, what position he's taken? He is now arranging for me to be convicted and do life without parole while he hits the streets. It's a rat move. If you don't want to call him a rat, don't call him a rat. It's a rat move. And I said, think about this, John. Think about it carefully. Is that exactly what you want to happen? It's gotta be that way, Sammy. That's just the way it is. You gotta go down for me to go out. I said, all right, then let's do it. If this is what this whole thing boiled down to, killing each other, not only killing each other, but we're putting each other away and we're doing fucking unheard of things. If this is Goza Nostra, the Goza Nostra I lived and killed and did everything under the sun for, without question, 
without hesitation, I quit. I quit Cosa Nostra, I quit him, and I got in touch with the FBI. November 1991. I was 20 years old at the time. I remember it as if it was yesterday. There's always some outside hope that somebody's gonna flip. We didn't think John could ever do it. That ego was never gonna let that happen. Of all the guys, Sammy might be of the mind. As much of a wise guy as he was, he also was a family guy, more so than these other guys. You know, 11 months go by and word gets sent to Maddie and Frank that Sammy might want to cooperate. Reaching out for the FBI was something I never imagined in my entire life that I would do. I knew at that point my life was over as Salvatore Sammy to Bo Gravano. I would be called a rat, a traitor, an informer. I would be called a million different names. My family would have to live through this horror, but I was done. I had to leave. So when I clearly decide to cooperate, I go into this room with my wife and my daughter. They came in, smiling, kissing me, hugging me. I said, I'm gonna tell you something that is gonna probably rock you. Something you would never expect from me. My daughter, what the? I got in touch with the government. I'm gonna cooperate, I'm gonna flip. I'm gonna get the fuck out of this case. I'm gonna get away from John. When I went up on the visit that time, it was different than every other time. My father had a different type of energy. And as soon as he sat down, I remember just feeling like a vibe from him. And I remember he just started off that he's gonna do something that goes against everything that he ever taught me to believe in, everything that he believes in. And I probably won't understand it at this time, but hopefully, he, you know, someday I will. And then I just remember him looking at me and he said, I'm gonna cooperate with the government. And at that particular moment, I felt like he just stabbed me right in the heart. My daughter went hysterical, crying, and ran out the fucking gate. I was just in shock. It was like a surreal moment because I never expected those words to come out of him. And I remember crying because that's all I wanted to do. And he looked me in the eyes and said, someday you'll understand. I just couldn't. I was like, anything that he was saying to me at that moment was just, I wasn't really even hearing him. I was just building up the anger. It was fear. It was anger. It was hurt. And I honestly felt betrayed by a man that I've trusted my whole life. It's so hard to explain it. I don't even know where the fuck I was. It felt like everything was in slow motion. It wasn't me sitting there talking or watching my daughter. It felt like I was out of my body and I was somewhere else looking at it. And I was actually talking to myself. Sammy, why are you doing this? Why would you do this? That's what it felt like. It didn't feel real. It was so massive to me that I even questioned, maybe I should have just killed myself. It was the, the worst moments I ever had in my life. I had so many bad moments. People dying and all kinds of things. But this had to be amongst one of the worst moments I ever had in my life. I don't even want to talk about it because I'm getting emotional again right now. And I don't want to even talk about it. I don't remember words. No, I don't know. I don't know. Let her explain it, what she felt or said. But that's how I feel right now. I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. Once we take him out, there's no putting him back. This is life and death for him. We've got to talk. What do we think he's going to do? I mean, in my mind, this was the biggest threat to my case. My case was made. I didn't need a witness. These guys were all going to jail. Sammy Gravano can only hurt my case at that time in my mind because he's somebody the defense attorneys can do all sorts of stuff with. You can't question a tape. 
Comes one day, my name is on a list. When the place is packed, they do this thing. They rotate prisoners. They call it uh, Otisville Run. They put 10, 12 prisoners on a chain and they bring them to Otisville Prison to relieve the pressure a little bit. You stay there maybe a month or two and then you come back. They put me on this list. The logistics should be somewhat easy. You still gotta keep it very quiet because there's no doubt the minute the mob finds out this guy's cooperating, he's dead. So a night came where they tell me, you're on the Otisville run. And at the end of the night, they cuff me. They put me on the chain. There's about 10 guys, 12 guys in front of me on this chain. Each guy is leg chained together. I'm in the back. When we get down on the elevator, we're on the main floor. They stop. Sammy was obviously deemed like the threat of threats. They were also concerned that it, this was a ploy for him to just escape from us. So now we're, we're going into a series of conversations of logistically, where are we going to keep this guy? They wanted to just keep him in a prison cell. And I'm like, that. no, that's not going to work. They take my leg chain off of that chain gang. They let the chain gang keep going. And two guys come out from the side in suits. They're FBI agents. They take him out of his cell to bring him down. The whole MCC knows something's going on. And I think John knew within minutes that Sammy was out and that can only mean that he's flipped. When they take me out the side door, this big steel door, it's raining. I could hear helicopters in the background. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of flashing lights, NYPD, everybody's got their lights on, FBI agents all over the place. And there's a, a woman, a female guard, and she looks at me and she says, oh, no, Sammy, oh, God, it's not you. It literally broke my heart. She obviously had tremendous respect for me, and it must have broke her heart to see that I was going out with agents although his family was probably foremost in it. He understood from the dealings with John in the MCC while they were listening to the tapes, he saw betrayal. The one tape that puts the murders on Sammy, Sammy's not in the conversation. It's John and Frankie and it's John railing about Sammy. I got in the car and like a big motorcade, everything moved with me. All these cars, vehicles, trucks, helicopters, everything moved with me. Word we get back once we take Sammy out is John knew within minutes. And what we heard again, because we're not there to witness any of it, is he just, he lost himself. I mean, he couldn't believe it on some respect. I think more though was he understood he was never seen the light of day. guy like John, he's not a lawyer. He thinks he could beat everything. Sammy turning on him, and he was the guy who put Sam in these positions. That just crushed him. We go to a plane. The plane flies down to Virginia. I asked them where I'm going, and they told me Quantico. And I'm going in this building, and I thought to myself, John Gotti, if anybody would break me, it was you. My love, my trust, everything I, I had in you, you're responsible for this. When I walk into the Quantico, I know my life is over, but this is how it begins. You just listened to episode one of Our Thing. The next episode will be released with audio and video the first part of 2021. For more information, visit SammyTheBull.com.